you, Sab and Docker Meetup, for having me here. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, demystifying container primitives and runtimes. So uh, you have seen a high-level talks on like uh, Docker securities and uh, uh, Kubernetes. This particular talk is more about like a prequel to them. Like how does actually container works? What what are the things in the OS which makes containers to run, or which makes container possible? Okay. So yeah, my name is Rohan. I work as a DevOps and uh, in AWS. So I started as in teaching and system admin, then uh, Amazon data center, and now as in DevOps. Okay, I'm not representing Amazon. So yeah, so outline for today. So yeah, today's outline is like, uh, uh, we'll see like what are actually containers, how do we define containers, and what are the primitives, what are the building blocks which makes containers, and what are, the, what are the different runtimes which are available today? And the firecracker. So yeah. So what are containers? So uh, first, first to gauge the understanding, I, I would like to know like, how many of you are just uh, uh, the beginners? Beginners for Docker? Okay. Intermediate and advanced? Okay. So I have like a lot of stuff for both categories. Okay, so yeah, so if we say like if if we if I ask like uh, what are containers? So what are how how will you define it? Like is it VM? <coughs> no. Does it look like VM? Yeah. At the at the high level, we can have shell in it, just like VMs, but it it feels like VM because it has own process network and uh, we ha we can have own packages and those things. So one more thing, like how many of you used like uh, CH root? Like CH root is a program of Linux, which was like a very early implementation of a container. So you can consider uh, containers as like CH root or maybe advanced CH root. So it gives you a process isolation. What containers are not, they don't have their own kernel. They don't, they can't boot up their own OS. They, they can't have their own PID and it's a, it's just a collection of processes in which we isolate. Okay, so this is a basic difference. On the on the left, I have a, a VM which has hypervisor, individual guest OS, binaries, and applications. On the right, I have a, a Docker engine which has just libraries and uh, the application. So, again, what are containers? So it's a it's a collection of uh, it's a like uh, containers are abstraction over the several uh, Linux technologies, which are basically uh, like uh, the CPU, memory, disk, and those kind of things. Like how do we isolate and group them together to make a, dip a different process running? So container has been there from a lot of time, and in last uh, three, four years, it has got a like, good surge in adoption. And, uh, and, and one of the major implementation of containers is Docker. Because Docker has uh, come up with uh, uh, easy to use tools which like which has made uh, uh, containers easy for the masses to run things. So, yep. So what? The, the, uh, uh, in short, there are like four auto, four atomic uh, functions Docker like to build the image, to push the image, to pull the image, and to run the container. Right. So this is how the things work. We have a Docker file, we write a Docker file, we build it, we push it to uh, Docker registry, then then we pull it and then we run it, right? So these are the these are the basic components. So every Docker has two components, the, the Docker installation, which one is client, and the Docker daemon, which is Docker host, or the, or the you can consider it as a Docker service. And there's a, th a third service, which is registry, which could be a uh, Docker Hub or any private registry. Okay, so yeah, so as we see, like uh, when we uh, when we have a Docker file, we build it. This is the kind of image we get. Image is a single file which contains all the dependencies, all the configuration which are required to that particular uh, run that particular application. So it has its own boot f boot fs. It has own uh, b kind of base image and the uh, instructions which you add over it. Now. When we when we hit a like uh, when we start a container, we use a command uh, Docker run and we just give an image name. So what does happen at that time? So as I said, like there are uh, two components of Docker. So 
the docker run the, when we run a docker it uh, it passes uh, the docker client passes the command to docker server and then docker server has a uh, image cache so it checks whether the image is available over there or not if it's available it runs from there if not it pulls from the registry and it starts the container so uh, a running container is nothing but a kind of instance a running instance of an image okay so docker has two parts client and daemon docker client does not actually do anything the the main comp the main part is done by the docker daemon which is docker server okay so docker server is actually responsible for responsible for creating images ma maintaining containers uploading images doing everything which is possible today by a docker okay so uh so like we have discussed like how does uh, things work and those things so you might have a uh, doubt or have a question like how does this things works so how many of you have like uh, tried opening the kernel code for linux kernel.org and like so have you tried uh, grabbing out uh, containers lxc or those things so if you try to do uh, a grab of containers you will not find anything or if you find anything it won't be a relevant to dockers because container itself is not a uh, capability of kernel so the capability of kernel which is used to uh, run containers is c groups and name spaces so in this next section we'll discuss what are c groups what are the name spaces and related things okay yeah so building blocks so this is how uh, this is how uh, linux kernel looks today or the complete os you have number of applications like chrome terminal and number of things and kernel is a intermediate uh, function which uh, which talks to the hardware and the application talks to kernel so this is how uh, linux system works today okay so most of the linux systems have their own kernel and yeah so uh, when we say name space in c group so name space is a, is nothing but a, but a kind of uh, isolation it provides isolation like uh, this particular section of hard drive this particular section of network or that this particular set of users are 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 belonging to this particular process right and the c groups c groups is a kind of metering and uh, limiting factor so it it limits like uh, uh, how much memory your container can use how much uh, cpu it can use and those things if even if you don't set the limit it it can you can use c groups to account for the memory and other resources okay so how does these two things fit together let's see an example suppose you have uh, uh, two applications both of them have a requirement that they should have two different python versions so in a particular system without using environment in python you can't have two versions of python running right so with the help of containers you can have this thing so the dotted line is a container boundary and let's further zoom out so this is the view which container sees when we run a container it sees like it has this application kernel and those resources over there yep so now let's uh, further do a deep dive on like what are control groups in depth okay so yeah you uh, as I, I have given a, a document link over here so if you want to read about like what are the actual implementation of c groups what are the uh, functions you can read over there uh, okay so what do c groups do they organize all the process in the system they limit or prioritize uh, uh, resource utilization they account for re resources okay so c group the c group itself is a abstraction framework however the subsystems which you can see memory cpu and and uh, network these are the actual concrete implementations okay and within a sub within a uh, uh, c group they are there are like number of subsystems so subsystems is what are the resources which you want to uh, control or account using a uh, c group okay so it could be memory cpu uh, the disk ios the discrete process ids uh, the actually what is the container is cpu memory pinning freezing and those things so what i'll do is i'll i'll discuss the major subsystems which comes into the play okay so yeah some basics like uh, every c group has has its own hierarchy this means cpu has, has its own hierarchy memory has its own hierarchy and i'll show you how so this is the location sys fsc group so when you run a container and if you go to the uh, this particular location if you do ls you'll see these are the subsystems which you can see on your system okay 
So it, for for the Ubuntu based systems, it it is typically mounted over a Sys FSC group for the uh, Amazon Linux, Red Hat, CentOS kind of system. You'll find it under the uh, slash C group option. Okay. So and uh, yeah. So whatever uh, whatever container you run or whatever process you run, it, if if you run with a C group, you'll find. Uh, that particular process inside one of the subsystem, whatever you have used, okay. And I'll uh, in the demonstration part, I'll show you how. So yeah, so the memory C group. So this is our most important C group. So uh, uh, you can have like uh, memory C groups give you uh, option to enforce some kind of limits. So it could be soft limits and hard limits. So if you but, uh, if you remember, while running a, a Docker run using command, we give memory and the memory reservation, right? So memory is the uh, hard limit and memory reservation is the soft limit. So those things comes from the C group. C groups gives the capability of uh, giving the soft limit and hard limit. And if you define the soft limit, you may know like uh, it allows container to use whatever uh, is a resource av available, but it uh, helps in like uh, reclaiming the memory when the system is under the contention. And the hard limit, hard limit is the one beyond which uh, your application cannot use uh, any memory. And if it tries to use, you will give out of memory. Okay, so uh, you might be knowing that there are uh, two kind of triggers for OOM. One is at the kernel level, which is which is uh, uh, started or which is triggered by a kernel, and one is at the C group level. So the one which is at the C group level is for a particular container or particular process, and one which is at the kernel level is. It, uh, could be for like any process which is running on the OS. So it is always uh, recommended to use the hard hard limit at the container level because uh, it, it won't disturb the uh, the complete Docker system itself. Okay. So the next C group is the CPU C group. So CPU C groups helps in uh, keeping keeping the track like how much CPU time or how much uh, threads or processes are uh, used by that particular process. Okay. So you can set weights, but uh, if you see, we can't set the CPU limits. You can you can set uh, you can set the weights kind of thing like this. Uh, this this process can use this much CPU and this one, this one, but you can't limit it directly. So the next C group is the next important C group is device C group. So it gives the control over like uh, what are the different devices on the underlying system can be used by the container. So one of them is uh, the random and the null, which is used for generating entropy, or it could be uh, the GPU, uh, the GPU nodes and those devices. So you might be knowing like uh, under slash dev, we have all the devices, right? You have all the disk, you have all the devices, USB printers and those things. So this is a particular C group, which allows us to share uh, the underlying uh, devices with the container. So the next part is namespaces. So as we have seen in the intro part, the namespace is used for isolation, right? So it provides the isolation mechanism. It changes, uh, 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 it, it, like the C, C, uh, C group is for limiting how much uh, resource uh, process can use. And namespace is limiting what, what are the resources which a process can see. And it, uh, just like uh, C groups, namespace also has some kind of subsystems. And we'll see how. So these are the available namespaces. Network, f uh, file system, process ID, inter-process communication. So for an example, uh, what does network namespace do? So uh, when we start a container, or we, when we start a container, it gives a, a connection to container to the your ETH0 or bridge. So the network namespace is the one which uh, helps in uh, connecting or wiring that particular container to the actual network. So file system is when uh, you mount something uh, to your container. The process ID is like uh, every container is an pro individual process. And you, uh, when you uh, exec into the container, you see the container cannot see the other process. Or when you do a PS from your uh, system itself, from Docker, uh, from the Docker host, you see the, all the process over there. So the the namespace gives the isolation to that particular process, not not to per, uh, entire system. Okay, so the network namespace is very uh, fr frequently used uh, 
namespace in container it provides a separate network for per con for a particular container per container okay so best part of uh, network namespace is you can uh, if if you know like how do, how does the namespace works so even after creating the container you can get inside that particular namespace and you can run random commands or the best part of network namespace is you can switch between the network namespace suppose you have two processes and if you want to share the network namespace this means the same eth0 should be visible on both containers you can make that possible using the network namespace okay so it is uh, widely used in uh, in pods and uh, ecs service in ecs there's a network mode called aws vpc where a particular container gets its own eni so network namespace is a uh, function which comes into the picture okay so uh, the important part of network namespace is once we give the network namespace to, to a particular service that a particular container that particular container gets its own network space this means it will get its own uh, ip routing table ip tables and sockets okay so if you have if you might have done uh, docker exec into the container you will see eth0 and a, a local ip 172 series right when you come out you see uh, some other ip on your system so that happens because of network namespace so other name is other important namespace is pid namespace pid is process identifier so uh, where does it comes into the picture it comes into the picture in isolating the processes so that one process should not see other so this is the very uh, fundamental namespace which, which is used in uh, running the containers okay another important uh, namespace is mnt so when you do uh, mount a volume and those things so this is the namespace which comes into the picture which mounts or which uh, which shares the namespace with the actual mount and your container so that only that container can see that storage other containers would not be able to do so this is also important uh, uh, concept in uh, namespace that uh, the namespaces can be shared across the processes so, uh, so process one consider process one as in one container b and c the four containers so you can have a pid namespace shared between two containers and you can similarly you can have network namespace shared between three con two containers and the mount space shared between three containers so this can be done via uh, docker client itself or you can do it via command command lines of linux okay so next part is uh, run times so what is container runtime runtime is nothing but a, a a program written which helps in executing these namespaces in c groups so when you say i want uh, this i want to start this particular container uh, runtime is the part of program which creates a namespace in c groups for that particular process and runs it okay so once the container exits the namespace and uh, the c groups are destroyed so the different examples of container runtimes are the docker container d crio which is used in kubernetes rkt and system b spawn which is like almost deprecated but it's, uh, right now it's still there so there's an organization called uh, the open container initiatives oci which is standardized like how if you, like suppose if you want to develop your own runtime so it gives the recommendations or set of instructions that th these are the things which should be there in your runtime so that it would be working with other uh, counterparts as well okay so run c is the runtime which powers docker so uh, whenever you get a time when you do a docker ps uh, on your host system try to grab run c you'll see a special process over there or you can check it on the command line as well okay so uh, as i said like uh, the oci gives the uh, the format like how your uh, runtime should look like so uh, this uh, this is what it gives it gives like uh, these are the number of parameters which your uh, runtime should know or should be using okay so every container is a is a is a is a bundle so this bun by bundle i mean it has a file system which has uh, your uh, which has your base image and those things and if you untar the image so when when we do a docker pull you can do do a dump after a dump you get a tar file if you untar it you'll see there's a json document which defines what are the different layers 
which are which this container uses, and you'll see the same uh, JSON file over there, which defines how how this container is built, how it should be used. Okay. So these are the major uh, runtimes available. So one one of the important is container D, and uh, the others as well. So LXD, LXD is a Linux container which was used earlier. Now not. Not not in use and CRIO is the implementation of implement implementation done by uh, Kubernetes teams. Uh, Firecracker is the uh, runtime which is like uh, out of uh, AWS and RunZ which is like the base of everything. So this is how uh, runtime looks. So when you when you issue a command at the at at this place when you issue a command like Docker run it goes to the Docker engine then it goes to the container D. Then container D starts a shim, and that shim starts a run C, and that run C starts this uh, container. Okay, so uh, when, next time when you uh, run a container, uh, when when the container is running, try to do a PS over the container. You'll see, or, or let me show you. Is it visible? See, like, uh, oh. I have one container running. So if I do PST, you'll see container D, shim, and nginx. So the nginx, uh, the container D takes over the control moment the run C has completed its work. So the uh, runtime would not, uh, runtime generally does not uh, use to run used to keep running all the time it just executes the container and it quits and it give and it gives the uh, control to container d okay so you'll see docker d this is the daemon itself this is the container d and these are the sub processes right and let's see the c groups as well uh, So within memory, you'll see these are the number of subsystems. Within memory, these are the number of nodes. Within nodes, you'll see Docker. So you'll see this only when the container is running. Moment I stop the container, this uh, a particular node will be gone. So let's see what is inside the Docker. Within inside the Docker, you'll see this. This is the, uh, the container ID of uh, our container. So within, the, within this container ID, you'll see uh, these nodes, and uh, from there we can see like uh, what are the strats which are, what are the strats, what is the memory which is being used. So let's try to see this. So you'll see these are the stats for this particular container with respect to memory, right? So when you do a Docker stats uh, from the Docker CLI, this is the same thing which you get over there. So these are the building blocks. So this is how the uh, the complete uh, the things are wired up. So uh, these things these are individual components. This means uh, if you don't wish to use Docker, you can have container D and uh, run C installed in the system, and you can directly interact with that. 
okay? But you'll not get the same functionality which Docker gives you. Or if you if you don't like container D, you can just have uh, run C and you can start your containers. But run C will just execute the containers. It will not build the container for you. It will not push or pull the containers. Okay. Yeah. So the Linux containers. These are the uh, uh, very primary kind of containers which came into the picture uh, a long time back, even before uh, uh, even before the Docker and those things. So LXE, uh, LXEs are still there. So if you want, uh, you can install LXE and it will give you the similar functionality as LXE. When, even when Docker started, the first version of Docker uh, came up, was based on LXE only. Later, they, later they, they started their own version called uh, uh, Container D and Run C. Okay? So now the Docker engine. Docker engine, as, as we discussed, like uh, it is a, uh, it is a client-server kind of model, in, in, in it, and it talks uh, using the REST APIs, and the Docker helps you in managing the container, the complete lifecycle itself. Okay, the images, builds, execution, and those things. Okay, so these are the components of Docker: Docker API, Docker CLI, plugins, container D, which is your uh, runtime. Okay. And for the for building the Docker, uh, this is the Docker building kit, networking, uh, the different no network plugins like uh, the bridge and those things. Those functionality comes from here. These are the uh, volumes, uh, volume plugins like the Rexray and the different volume plugins which you use. So th those are the different components. The pl it is a pl plugin based system. So apart from uh, container D, there is one more uh, runtime called uh, RKT, or we pronounce it as Rocket. So it is also a similar kind of implementation, but it is more uh, application specific. So I haven't used uh, uh, Rocket directly, but uh, uh, one of the implementation I've seen in, is in Kubernetes, where like they were they were trying to use runtime as uh, RKT. So one in, one of the uh, thing uh, is uh, when you start a Docker, you have a functionality deck. Suppose you don't want to use Run C, you can have your other or some some other runtime and you can use docker along with that as long as it follows the oci standards okay so one of the example of that is firecracker so firecracker is a one of the uh, container runtime which came out of uh, uh, aws and it is an open source people used to contribute it so uh, what is uh, different in firecracker different in firecracker is like for every container we launch a micro vm this means at the very beginning we discussed the difference between VMs and containers, right? So the micro VMs gives the some of the functionality of VM, like the security of VM, to the containers. Okay, this means you can run a multi-tenant uh, kind of workload on the same Docker host, because today if you if you have two customers and you're running a workload of two customers on the same host, you never know they can see the process of each other or they can ex exploit some vulnerability, right? So if you have the isolation of the VM level, this means uh, this is completely secure. Okay. So in uh, Firecracker, in in uh, in Run C, we we used to provide uh, uh, the OS resources as a part of uh, a kernel and directly map it to uh, containers. But in Firecracker, we present them as in different devices. B different devices. This means uh, it is it is supported by KVM. This means uh, the disk kernel and the root FS, those are presented as in different devices altogether. And in Firecracker, uh, we have removed uh, everything uh, which is like unnecessary. Only thing which you get in the uh, micro VM is the display, keyboard, and the block devices and the CPU memory. That's it. So we have, uh, we have uh, just reduce the surface area, so the surface area is short, so there's no no point or that there's a less possibility for attack surface. Okay. So yeah, this was my part. So any questions for me? Yes. So I'm a cloud architect and 
this question is more related to fundamental so there are different scenarios and you mentioned some run times and the engine what is what is different criteria you use to choose certain run time for certain application or certain let's say the fundamental question is sometimes you have to build something for a customer and you want to start from os what os you choose what kind of run time you choose and how you deploy so how what are different criteria as you think of when you yeah. use so you can you can see this as a, uh, like what kind of orchestrator you are using suppose if you are using kubernetes so in kubernetes you will not find uh, uh, the docker uh, the docker client itself you'll see the kubelet is directly interacting with uh, containerd and in other systems like if you see ecs which is a uh, implementation of amazon's orchestrator you'll see there is a docker client and docker server itself so it depends at what level you want the control because the every level every layer you add over the uh, run time you add some functionality and you add some abstraction so if you want to manage those things manually you can have the lower layer suppose uh, uh, and one of the example i just showed is like if you are okay, if if you, if uh, uh, the docker host has just few workload or just uh, workload from just few companies uh, you not mind multi multiple containers running on the same host but as, uh, let's consider the point of view of, of uh, uh, cloud providers if you, they want to have multiple con containers on the same host they may see like security as a major concern right so that's why they'll they'll select firecracker so it depends what are the things you want in your runtime if you want more security you can use firecracker and the uh, many implementations like firecracker itself you can use that or if you want to just have uh, uh, the normal functioning if if you are company you are in pro you are on prem you can have runc so those kind of stuff okay thanks ah uh, yeah i have one question yeah. Uh, so uh, I develop an application. Mm -hmm. I build that application and I, I create the image. And uh, when I run that image, then how to uh, define how much memory, how much space? As you told, this is the daemon thread, like Java in the daemon thread, that running in the thread. Mm -hmm. So how to define? Okay, I am the architect. I have hundred service, so I can how I define? Okay, this much memory or space required to run my this container. So how to uh, define in the higher management also, or any other thing Okay, you, you mean like, uh, 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 how would you decide like how much memory or CPU you should use? Yeah, yeah. So generally, generally what we do is, uh, we, we benchmark uh, the application. We, we start with uh, like suppose one GB, one CPU, then we put our load on it, then see like what is the uh, benchmark result. So if, if it is going around 100% all the time, we'll consider it, incre we'll consider increasing it. So there's no, uh, you, you can't say there's just one number which will fit for all. It it comes over the time. Okay, uh, I have some hundred customer is there one application. Mm -hmm. It at a time one hour hundred customer. So how to define? Okay, I cannot do like uh, manually. You can test uh, one hour. Okay, how much memory will take? Then after one hour, I can take how much memory I can benchmark that way, or I can directly how to identify. Okay, this is the memory required. Hundred customer, hundred transaction is happening. So how to identify? I think if you if you are running multi tenant kind of workflow, okay, the, uh, as you are saying, so what you can do is you can start with a, a basic number. Or let's consider an example of let's forget the container. How do you start a VM today? You start with some default numbers, right? Yes. yes. When you see the utilization is going hundred percent over the time, then you consider increasing it. Otherwise, it it's it's just ten twenty percent. You have to decrease it. And another one question, yeah. suppose I have two container, two application, two container is there. Mm -hmm. And uh, suppose one container is communicate another container because I need some fetch some data. So in between that is the another container is down. So in between that is the some down is happening. So how to keep that transaction? Suppose I am sending some request. One container is going to another container. In between that is the some down second container. So okay. how to maintain that data? How to capture data? Where I have to put that data? See, data? Uh, as you said, like you have multi uh, multi uh, customer approach. What you can do is you can have multiple bridges or custom defined networks. So if you, if you have uh, uh, one customer is on one, one particular bridge, this means they'll share a, a one broader network namespace. Okay. 
this means other containers won't be other containers or other customers which are running inside they won't be able to sniff uh, the net network over here no uh, what's my question one container is depend to another container mm -hmm. because suppose when i search one site the site means that is the search functionality another functionality is there i fetch some data from other container okay. so uh, when i am fetching the data that time some second container is down so customer don't wait for that moment so that data where we some that million of second that uh, data also lost yeah. so how to maintain here i i don't think the, uh, in terms of network there is a solution for that or but in the, if you if this is something like uh, your you have some logs and you have some uh, sidecar which collects the log what you can do is in, if this is if your data is so critical and you know like the second container can go down i would prefer to dump that data over the volume and then pass it over so that you have a buffer even the container goes down you have something where you can pick up okay thank you there yeah take up the last question I just uh, wanted to know how multi-tenancy can be achieved through a fire tracker. So fire tracker, I think it's mainly for the security purpose when you uh, impose additional security on the container. But how does it can help uh, in achieving it, the multi-tenancy? It helps like, uh, uh, it gives you a VM kind of boundary. You know, like uh, when you uh, when you launch a, a VM on VMware, this means it has its everything of every, every device of its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This means the one VM cannot see other, or if it's EC2 instance, one EC2 instance cannot can be on the different same host, but you cannot see the data of others. So uh, the the firecracker it, it uses the uh, virtualization approach of KVM. So it it give, literally gives you a, a a micro VM. This means it has the complete isolation, which you see for the VM. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, uh, it's not just from the security perspective, it's also from the performance perspective as well, because if you like, uh, if you start a VM, it has the full, the full-fledged OS, right? That OS has number of modules, number of things. In Firecracker, it's uh, just a stripped-down kernel. This means it has just a few, uh, few uh, very stripped kernel and few drivers. Mm -hmm. Okay, how does it different from the CH root? Pardon? How does it different from the CH root? Yep, in CH root, you get, a, you just get a. Uh, a jail for a particular process, right? Mm -hmm. But the difference between it, it it has the same difference which which is between the containers and CH root. For the containers, you get a, a complete network stack, a storage stack, and those things. For Firecracker, again, you get the same things. Mm 